Welcome to Security Architecture Podcast, where we help cybersecurity professionals to stay ahead of the curve and ensure they are successful in their cybersecurity journey. Hi, I'm Evgeny. I'm Dimitri. We have here Paul from IBOS. Both Paul and IBOS are a second time on the show. Paul, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what happened with IBOS maybe for the last two months, three months? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so this is uh, Paul Martini. I'm the CEO and CTO of IBOS. Uh, it's good to be here with you guys. Uh, basically, um, IBOS provides what, what Gardner calls SASE, but the idea is, is pretty simple. Uh, you just need to connect to applications um, in the cloud and within different buildings and offices. And uh, what IBOS does is allows users to connect directly to those applications uh, through a cloud service, so cloud security service. So you think of um, really the, the transition from, you know, network security features that you might find in firewalls or proxy appliances. Think of uh, getting those same capabilities in a SaaS-based form. So users get fast and secure connections from anywhere uh, connected to anything. And actually, um, I think, you know, with the evolution of SASE and, and uh, SaaS delivered network security, one of the nice things about it is uh, instead of using things like VPNs um, or different types of software to connect users to the things they need, uh, being able to connect all everything and anything to the cloud service, in this case, iBoss, so that as users connect through the service, the cloud service, they're connected to everything with all of the security, CASB, malware defense, data loss prevention, um, very simply. And, and actually, of course, the users are all, are all using you know, video conferencing and Office 365. So being able to connect quickly because they're going through a cloud service versus going through the office, uh, makes it easier for um, the administrators to manage, but also uh, gives the end user experience and productivity, makes, makes them a lot more productive. So uh, yeah, the last three months uh, have been uh, pretty crazy for us uh, just because um, every organization that we find is going through a cloud transformation where they're, they're migrating from working only in the office to users working from anywhere, including home. And maybe some of these users never coming back to the office or, or doing a sort of a mixed work environment, but being able to have um, all of the network security functions transition to a cloud-based service um, allows them to not worry about where the user is sitting and, and uh, ensure that those users can connect to, um, to virtually everything they need. So we've been transitioning lots of large um, organizations, Fortune 5, uh, Fortune 10, um, across energy and, and um, different verticals, finance, insurance, and uh, the amount of bandwidth and the amount of devices that we've seen connected through the cloud service uh, is just astronomical. I mean, it's um, virtually um, millions and millions of devices um, just over the last uh, several months. So it's an interesting time. So last time when we spoke, you told us that the product that's addressing the outbound browsing called iBoss. And this time we're talking about remote access. Is it stays the same? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the uh, nice things about the concept with SASE, uh, Beyond Corp, you know, what's Google defined, Zero Trust, is that the idea is that um, SASE is just as much about, and SASE is Secure Access Service Edge, just as much about security as it is connectivity. So uh, although, um, you know, we've been delivering CASB, malware defense, data loss prevention, filtering, all sorts of capabilities, you, you would security capabilities you would get uh, through a SaaS service. The, the idea with um, ZTNA and Zero Trust is that instead of connect, having a user turn on a VPN to connect to an office in order to access a private application that's hosted within a data center in an office, well, the idea here is that you connect all of the locations, the buildings, the offices, um, Azure, AWS, you connect all of the applications to the cloud service, iBoss. And because the user's already connected through iBoss in order to access anything and everything, we can look at the user's role and basically make it appear that everything's on the internet for that user, even though some of the applications that they're accessing are actually um, private. So if, I, if someone else were to try to open that same URL or remote desktop link or application, they wouldn't be able to access it. But for the particular user based off the role, the, the cloud service iBoss is connecting uh, that user to all of the resources, making them easily available um, in public. So the private access is just an additional component of the, of the cloud. So, Paul, so the name is private access for the offering? Yeah, we, we just actually, we call it um, a ZTNA, uh, private access for iBoss. It's, an ad, it's actually an add-on uh, for the service. I guess it's a good time to jump and understand the architecture. 
you explain in the big details the architecture last time for outbound browsing. So we want to understand if it's the same, it's different. And for someone that didn't watch the first episode, please explain and show again how you guys operate and work and what's unique about your architecture or how it's worked differently. Yeah, absolutely. Let me share a couple of uh, diagrams here that uh, that'll be useful. So one of the things uh, that you're going to see here, and I think that that's, the concepts for private access are, are pretty important. I'm just, and I'm actually pulling, I'm going to pull up a lot of diagrams. This is just here from, from the IBOS uh, website. But the idea here is if, if you were to look down um, at this diagram, uh, the idea, and, and we've shown this before, where you have any device, we don't really care about the device type, really located in any network. It could be um, in your office or working from home. But what we like to think about is if someone's in your conference room, how do you know they're not on, your, uh, on a 5G connection on their phone or on the neighbor's Wi-Fi? So the location is really irrelevant working from home. It's always an untrusted network. They're connected through a service. Um, that's the middle box here. Uh, that's iBoss before they access any you know, public or private destination. Uh, we have the little cubes here. Uh, the, the cubes re represent containerized gateways. That's where all the firewall, CASB proxy connectivity functions occur uh, within the service. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll um, kind of show more in detail as well is that the way that the ZTNA service is designed, it's not a separate service where you know, you're adding components for just private access or ZTNA. It's baked natively into the backbone of the cloud fabric. So every gate containerized gateway, which is designed to proxy and isolate your network data has ZTNA baked into it. So it can broker requests into, into different uh, locations, which is really important. And then, uh, you know, we always take the position that any network that the device connects through or connects to is uh, completely untrusted. It's just a form of transport, IP transport to get the user to the applications that they need. But if you compare the private access component here and you were to compare this, the traditional way of doing things where you have a user that's remote they turn on the VPN software on their computer, which connects them to the private network. And you can see here in the diagram that this is the dotted line. What's really happening is you're extending the untrusted home network and connecting that network to the trusted uh, data center network. So it virtually places the user on the network, which really introduces obviously some risk in terms of east-west traffic. So when people do port scans, maybe there's all the vulnerabilities that can go through the untrusted network at home and make it into the trusted network that hosts other sets of applications. And so this is a more traditional model. But as you compare this to more of a private access model, what you end up having is uh, users that are, let's say, working from home, they're already connected to the cloud service IBOS. So there's no need to turn on a VPN, for example. It's just they're always connected to, through the cloud service, um, IBOS in this case. And then what, ha what happens is because IBOS is connected to the data center and to the private applications, as well as anything else. What, what iBoss does is it looks at the user's role based off Active Directory, Azure AD, Okta, Ping. So you can do OUs or security groups. And based off the user's uh, role, it decides what, what that user should have access to. But it, when it grants the access to the application, it doesn't extend the dotted line or the dashed line, the network from the home into the private data center. What it does is it grabs the connection that the user is requesting for a private application and actually opens up a brand new connection. So there's actually a separate TCP handshake that originates from iBoss. And what iBoss will do is then place the network data right onto the port of that service. So for example, if you have a remote desktop server and you only want to give them RDP access in your data center, the, the iBoss service will know that that user should have access. And then it opens the connection and transplants the data right onto the port so that the user can't even do an east-west, let alone east-west scanning on the network. They can't even port scan the server. They only have access to that, just that particular service on that particular port. And so it's a form of micro-segmentation where the user can't ping the network, can't scan the network, can't scan the servers, but they have access to the, let's say the remote desktop service in this case. But if there's other things in Azure or AWS, remember all of those things are connected to iBoss. And so that they not naturally will feel to the user without turning on a VPN for all the different data centers and all the different networks, they just naturally have access to all of these locations. Can you talk a little bit about the component that you need to install in the data center? As far as the connectivity goes? Yes. Yeah, so, so if you look here and you dig a little bit deeper, um, you can see the, uh, sort of a one, two, three combination of sequences. So the, the first request, you have the user requesting a private portal, uh, let's say web destination, a website. The iBoss Cloud allows access because it sees that that particular user should have access to privateportal.com. 
It then opens a brand new separate connection to the private application, fetching the data, uh, returning the data through the cloud service back to the user. My private application is inside my data center and uh, my data center is not open to anything from outside. What is the requirement on the side of the data center? Do I need to install some type of server, clients? That's actually one of the most important questions because when you think about private access in ZTNA, something has to provide access to the private application. And so one of the things we were thinking about, because one of the uh, things we like about SaaS is the fact that you can enable feature capability and get all of the benefits without all of the headache. And um, if you think about deploying a one-off platform or virtual appliance or anything um, into your network or into your environment, if you're going to be, if you're truly compliant, SOC 2, SOC 1, ISO 9000, 27001, you're going to have to run pen tests and do a lot of extra work every time you add new components and new capabilities. But with SaaS, because the SaaS service delivers the capability already, and it's already going to be under your security posture, it providing that access simplifies your assessments and things of that nature. And so the way, what we wanted to do is, if we go back, um, and, and it shows here um, all of the um, kind of locations, private data centers and AWS, Azure, all connected to, to iBoss Cloud. If, I'm gonna, if I scroll back to this diagram here, this really ties back to this notion of containerization which is the core and fundamental architecture and how we deliver the SaaS service. So I think it's really important. We don't, we're not a containers platform. And what I mean by that is we're not designed to containerize your things and your stuff or give you containerized um, gateways or firewalls. But, but this importance of this architecture is really important because what it allowed us to do is when we baked in private access into the gateways, when, and if, I've, if I'm connected through an IBOS global data center, but yet there's a private cloud gateway it happens to exist in physical form in your data center. The, our iBoss cloud gateways can talk to the private physical gateways to, in order that, to access that application. So you have a physical appliance that sits in your data center in this particular scenario. However, the gateway is not just a ZTNA appliance. It's a full firewall proxy, decrypt. It has all the capabilities that you would find in any other containerized gateway within the service. So that's something that I would get from you, right? So there, there is some container that I'll have to run on my data center or on my private network to allow all of this access. In, in one scenario. But in, the other, in another scenario, what happens is if any of the gateways, and this is a common scenario, if any of the gateways have a path to that private resource through an IPsec or GRE tunnel, I can hit any gateway within the cloud fabric and the cloud service, and that gateways will go through the GRE and IP sector on that in order to access the service. So what it does, it gives you this flexibility to, you can do a mesh and figure out that in some cases it might make sense to have private cloud. In other cases, it might make sense to do tunnels, GRE or IP sec. And then another, and then there's other cases as well where remember containerization provides dedicated IP addresses for customers. So if I'm a customer going through the service, my IP addresses are always the same for me, not used by any other customer. So you can use that for comply to connect type policies. Also, you can use it for ACL. So if you want to do a DMZ without a tunnel and just say if, if, IP, if the IP source is from this address, then trust it because we know it's coming from gateways that are for your service. So then the dedicated piece kind of play a nice um, option there as well. Three options to do that. Either uh, IP stack tunnel, either GRE tunnel that's already existing. You can route the traffic through it or I can have the virtual appliance Yep, and those are the first three you see here. The, the, the fourth is um, access control ACLs. So do a DMZ and only allow access from the source APs of the gateways. And then the, the, this, this option here, which we really like, which is firewall as a service. Uh, we're the only SASE platform that automatically runs gateways in Azure when resources are in Azure that you need to access. So we co-developed with Microsoft a one-click firewall proxy. When you enable this feature, the platform will automatically create containerized gateways in Azure, auto route, auto load balance, and provide high availability uh, for securing any traffic entering or leaving Azure, in addition to providing private access. Because it already created the containerized gateways automatically, there's no user intervention. You don't deploy them or anything like that, but they'll run inside of your own VNet. So actually, uh, once you give us, turn this feature on within the Microsoft console, we're able to create the gateways in the VNets automatically and they will actually bridge to VDI, remote desktop, or any, anything you want VNets without ever deploying a virtual appliance. How will the traffic route from me to the data center, for example? Would I hit your cloud, then go inside your cloud, or it will then figure out how to get to the data center and route the traffic directly there? 
Yeah, definitely. So basically, if you look at this, I'm going to flip over to the console here, which is pretty extensive, but you'll see this um, zero trust section. It's an add-on. So when you go to this section here, I'm going to show you how the policy is created and I'm going to show you exactly how the network traffic makes it from the user to the private service. So as, as you look at um, as you look at this policy here, you create these policies and you link them to different by different criteria. So for example, I can link a policy to my username. So if I want to, if I say this user should have access to these destinations, I can do O user security groups. So I can do things like IT staff, um, uh, OU um, or security group within Okta or Azure AD. I can even link these to geos, where I can say coming from the US and IT staff, I want to give access to these private destinations. And so you're going to notice that these destinations here, this um, this is private routable IP. So these aren't publicly routable IPs, but the same would go for these domains. These aren't publicly accessible. Uh, things like portal.ibos.com, it's not a publicly accessible domain. So you have a bunch of private destinations here. And then as you look a little bit deeper on some of these guys, uh, this is a single IP down to a slash 32 subnet with a single port. So this means that I only have access to that specific port, but I can also do broader um, subnet. So I can do a slash 24, for example, with all ports. I think this is important and still better than VPN because of VPN. Yeah, this is really micro segmentation anyways. But, I, but if I'm going to show you, I'm going to connect to this particular one and then I'm going to show you how it actually did that just as an example. So I have um, this application that I'm, that I'm running. It runs in the background, but I can pop it up to the front, which is connecting me to my cloud and private access. It just sits here in the background um, in my taskbar. I'm hidden. And then what happens is if I were to go in and if you can look at this guy, let's, let's pull up this particular um, option here. So you can see that this one is um, an IP, an IP address 10, 1, 28, 16, 18 slash 32 with only access to the RDP port, remote desktop port 3389. And so that's, that's there. That's, and again, 10, the 10 network is not publicly routable. So I wouldn't be able to access this normally. So now I'm going to log in. Meanwhile, you're doing this. Does any of the customers use the technology internally to segment uh, traffic inside their own environment without going outside? Yeah, actually, um, one of the things one of the things that's interesting there is if you think about SD WAN, right, where you have appliances deployed at the office to connect office to office internal traffic. What's the difference between a user who can connect to everything, whether they're in the office or on the road. And why would you need it? If you don't have IOT or other needs like that, um, you can actually connect that user to other offices without SD-WAN appliances. So we, we believe the future, you know, moving forward longer term, that the notion of being located in the office or not, you're not, you don't need appliances to connect those users to the different resources. Typically they're going to go through the cloud service or the tunnels. But of course, if you have private cloud and you, you want to use the gateways in the data center, it can broker through that as well. So it's sort of a, um, a different model. But, uh, but yeah, they, uh, definitely a good way to maybe segment a user and force all the traffic through a micro segmentation through a service. And then here's, here's the RDP port, but here's one of the things that you're going to, that makes this more interesting than a traditional VPN. So I'm connected to the 10, 1, 20, 8, 16, 18. But I, if I try to ping it, unlike a VPN, there's no ping, you can't ping this. And then if you, if you, do, um, if you do the routes here, notice that the, in, unlike a VPN, there's no network route for the 10 network. It doesn't even show up in my routes. So, so what's happening here, yeah, the, the cloud service is instructing the, um, the agent whether this RDP is proxy aware or not. It tells the traffic, it intercepts the packets and it sends them to the cloud service. And the cloud service is routing this traffic to the right place. And actually because of the, the way the routing works, I can go in and change the policy. So maybe I go back to this policy here and I say, you know, instead of 3389, I want to do port 22 SSH, but in this case, can you do star like all of them? Yeah, like these guys here. That's all ports. Yeah, it's so basically you can be as ultra micro segmentation. You can do that as well. I recommend if you went from VPN, um, start with something broader because it's still it's still isolating the user from your network, and then you can go more specific. But I just changed this policy, and now it's it's automatic. I didn't. I'm still I'm still connected, but I can still open up other sites and resources, and they open up normally. This is the policy here, but if you look at the de the way the destinations are set up. It's, a, it's interesting in that basically this is a this is a private destination that doesn't exist on the internet here. But if you edit this destination, 
what you're going to notice it says this um, domain, including all the subdomains. I want to forward the DNS to a private. I can even I can even intercept oh, I see. the DNS. So the DNS request goes to the private network to get the resolution for the domain. Yeah, and it has the intelligence to make sure that the resolution makes it through the tunnel as well. So you can do things like forwarding to a DNS. You can overwrite the IP address and say that's the IP if you don't want to do a server, or you can you know, choose not to overwrite it. And then in this case here, it says restrict the path through this gateway. This happens to be a cloud gateway running the cloud service. And actually, um, there's some really nice tools as well that you can use. So if I want to test, for example, can I can I ping this resource? This is actually running a ping from that particular path. So you can test what the cloud service is going to see. Or I can okay. even connect, I can connect test connectivity to see what the service looks like. So there's a lot of tools here, but the idea here is that it's connected through this gateway, it's resolving the DNS, but, it, but a different gateway here if you look at this one in particular, the 113, if I open this, this guy, it's a subnet restricted to a private cloud gateway. So you can even mix and match. In one case I was using an uh, IP, the remote desktop was an IPsec tunnel. And then in, if I were to access this destination, it's gonna be uh, completely going through a private, a private cloud gateway. You mentioned that this is an add-on to the regular or offering you have. How you license the remote access? Yeah, we have a, a feature here, a ZTNA. It's basically the number of users and it's a monthly charge per user. So you give us the number of users that need private access. We enable the add-on and then you get this menu option here. And they can use it on a number of uh, stations or seats. That's right. On the number of licenses that they purchase for private access. So if I have like two computers at my home and I want to access from both of them, do I need two licenses or one? It's per user for the ZTNA server. Great. You mentioned that you tie to MFA and no uh, to different single sign-on providers. Can you quickly elaborate more how you guys work with different single sign-on and MFA providers? Yeah. So when you when you're tied to the private cloud service, you can choose any um, any provider you want. And actually, I'll show you here. So what, here, this is tied to Okta. And uh, this authenticated me through Okta. You can actually inject your multi-factor right in that spot so that they can actually even access, log in, or connect to the private resources. And we separate this from public ac applications and private, so you can choose what the behavior should be like for private or public. Do you support in, anything like a YubiKey or Titan key from Google? Well, we rely on the identity provider to do any of those extra checks. So if, if your identity provider supports it, then we, we do support that. Um, and then we also support um, client certificates. It looks like you need a client to use the service. And today, and most of the work being done remotely, and we are utilizing browser both for public browsing, but also for work for accessing documents, and even in some cases to review code. What are the solutions that are available on your side for this type of connectivity without using client or agent? Yeah, so the typical use case for us, because we want to capture all applications, SSH, RDP, and we agree with, um, with Gardner that leading SASE providers require an agent. Uh, that's, the reason, that's the primary use case for us. However, with reverse proxy, where you can use browser-based applications, that's actually a capability we're working on and releasing now. So it's basically, um, it's the reverse use case where you have an application that you might want to proxy through the service. However, with the dedicated IPs that we have within the cloud service, you can already do that by restricting those applications to just the IP addresses from the cloud service itself. And you, you can force users to use browser-based agentless to go through the service. So the things we're working on is making that configuration easier, uh, but the service supports you using a browser with dedicated IPs and, and forcing the traffic through the service just with basic browser. Uh, the only uh, restrictions there are, are technology restrictions. So for example, um, RDP, SSH, uh, maybe Git, or anything that doesn't, is not browser native, um, of course is gonna require an agent. I'm wondering, who is the agent? Who is, is everything supported? Can I do what? Can I do password changes? Can I do printing? What, yeah, 100%. And actually uh, today, the, um, we focus on all TCP protocols because we want everything to be transaction-based. And actually every voice, even SIP, um, they all um, have TCP underlying protocols nowadays because they need to be transactional. And so it's, um, even if the applications aren't proxy aware or browser aware, it'll still work, it'll grab. You can even do SQL queries through, you know, custom uh, SQL and things like that. But UDP is, what is UDP? 
Yeah, today we capture DNS for UDP, obviously. That's how we're doing the DNS resolution. But uh, if connecting UDP to a network is a lot more challenging in a zero trust environment because it's packet by packet versus transactional. So whereas TCP, we can actually associate the user and then create a separate transaction without moving a packet uh, directly between the user and the network. And so today we've, we've focused on TCP, any TCP protocol, and then UDP for DNS. Okay, so if you use UDP with VoIP, you may have a challenge. You may need to change, make some changes or use different protocols. That's right. And, and typically what we find, we haven't seen any VoIP nowadays, even the SIP protocol, that won't fall back to uh, TCP. And then that, that basically forces them into a zero trust model. If I'm connected now remotely, let's say to SSH to the database uh, in my private network, and I'm switching between one Wi-Fi network to another, right? So I'm roaming between two networks. Would this disconnect me from this database connection? I'll, I will have to reconnect from scratch or it will remain connected. It's actually transactional and it'll remain connected. And actually it's one of the strengths that we have. So one of the things that we've chosen for connectivity is uh, stateless HTTP tunneling as the underlying protocol to transport. And I can show you a good example of that. So if you see this, even, you know, we talk about switching between Wi-Fi networks, but it's a real issue. If you're using more traditional legacy VPN connectivity methods for SASE, switch between networks to go into this connected state and it's just, um, can be pretty, uh, frustrating. So if you look at this here, these are green now, and I go to um, speed test. I'm actually doing the, the podcast through the service. You can see the mm -hmm. my, my IP address here is 195, ends in 195.100. That IP address actually happens to be, I'm connected to this account. It happens to be one of these IPs. So in this case, it's this one here, 195.100. So that, but if I go back to this, and while I'm talking, I disable this, because of stateless HTTP tunneling, I'm completely disconnected. You refresh this and my IP, that's my real IP. So I can actually even not only switch between networks, it can steer traffic without interrupting any voice because of um, using a stateless HTTP underlying transport. And I think that that's important because if you look at any modern technology from other areas like APIs, um, REST, JSON, those kind of things, they're always stateless mechanisms over more legacy stateful types of sockets and things like that. So. Yeah, you can switch networks, you can jump between networks, no, no problems. What about reporting and UBA functionality? Now, when we work from home, in lots of the cases, we want to be user aware. Can you alert or tell the end customer that potentially you're getting doing something fishy, connecting from Toronto and connecting from Japan or something like this? Yeah, absolutely. One, one of the things as well, um, from our understanding, is that we're the only ZTNA platform that fully supports decryption for private access. And I think that that's important, uh, not because of, you know, when you think about private applications, um, maybe you might not be as concerned about malware, although you should, you should make sure that there's no malware being transferred between the end device and if they're uploading files and things like that. But the other part is data loss prevention, which is more major, and CASB so that you can do cloud application discovery, as well as if someone's downloading the source code repository, you might want to be able to inspect that. And of course, it's all TLS protected. So we actually, any capability, any policy that you can get for public applications, 100% apply to private access as well. So it's not limited. And that includes uh, user behavior analytics. So in like this case, this um, James Roberts, all of the links, all of the keywords, productivity loss, high risk, I can even go, you know, generate a report right away. I can drill into can, the log. Can you stop Yevgeny from connection or ask for two-factor authentication or some kind of escalation to make sure Yevgeny is Yevgeny? Yeah, so we're definitely any transaction is going to be identity-based. So without a doubt, we're going to know it's you and your role to connect you to that service. And the way you would do it on an application-to-application -application basis is you, you combine this with your identity provider. So your identity provider is still going to play a critical role because you still want the user to be able to authenticate against different applications and you can layer it. Yeah, but I, I guess the question is, if you see Evgeny doing something fishy, downloading or uploading too much information, would any way you will alert or, or tell the admin, guys, there is something bad going on. There is something strange going on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, and I was on the user behavioral uh, dashboards but actually we take it uh, further, not just on timestamp. We have different alerts around DLP, for example, DLP rules 
where we will decompress all the zip files, the PDFs, you know, looking for PI. But then in addition to, to doing that, uh, for the alerts that we can send out dynamically, not just based off group, user, target destination, we're even supporting things like Microsoft labels, where if you could tag sensitivity labels onto documents in Microsoft, we'll look for those and we'll alert on those as well. If we see the document. On private access as well. Yeah, exactly. Because we're decrypting, um, all of the policies apply to private access and these labels and everything else applies as well. Can you do anything against the seven zip? So basically you can decide what you want to happen if we can unzip the file. So you can actually block access, basically block the transfer if it's not decoded and let the user know as well as let the administrator know. Um, so if we, if, if there's a, if the password, if there's a lock or something like that on the zip file, then I, I think that is a big area for private access. A lot of them are not supporting decryption on private access. There's no way you can run, you know, DLP and other things like that, which is a really important question. We are done with the official part of the show and we're moving to open topics. Paul, anything you want to tell us more about the platform? No, I, I think, um, you know, the, the thing I would say is it is, it is um, good to see that, you know, when you think about the transition of movies, for example, from DVD players to Netflix or taxis to Uber, you know, we've always thought connectivity has to change the way people, the, you know, client to cloud or how people connect to applications. So it's, it's interesting to see just how quickly, especially in 2020, that it's, and it's not just because of people are temporarily re remotely working. I think people have seen that the applications that are delivered through the cloud and SaaS are, make things easier, faster, and actually they can work remotely and from home or from anywhere. And so we're seeing this transition from uh, really defined network perimeters and um, these ideas of ZTNA, uh, zero trust or private access. We have all of these different ideas that are now um, that are now becoming real. Yeah, so you have you have all these ideas, um, uh, all these things that are really be becoming real now. And so um, it's a really fun time. I think it's a really interesting time where we think a lot is going to change in the way in the way people connect uh, to different applications, private applications, cloud applications, and um, and I think that we've stayed very centered um, in terms of changing the way people connect from anywhere to anything. Like we're 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 super centered in that area. I mean, we do like what's going on in, in um, the cloud services like Azure, for example, firewall as a service. Don't, don't purchase and install a virtual firewall. Click a button and get that capability, but without the work of managing the virtual instance. Well, I have a question about remote access. Does any of your customers buy remote access only? Or it's always uh, combined with Azure offering? For, for us, it's always an add-on. So they're going to get, they're always using at least the core capabilities um, and then they add this on. But what, you know, with consolidation of capabilities, we hear pla uh, customers say they consolidate 10 platforms into one or eight into one. You're, you're really anything related to connectivity. They find that it's still more cost effective than just buying a VPN or, or running a, appliances. So, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's all. I mean, I, the, the only other thing is um, I'll show you one, one example of this Azure, which I, I just think it's really, um, really cool. And uh, Microsoft's been doing a great job here. But, you know, as we co-develop, this firewall as a service concept where you can just enable the, the option and it creates all of the firewall proxy, everything for you. No, no virtual firewalls or appliances. It's all one click. And it actually looks like this from within the platform, same capabilities. What you're gonna find is um, if you were to dig deeper to see what that looks like, you'll see these Azure gateways. But this, this really nice architecture that allows cloud, private cloud, Azure, kind of a multi-cloud environment so that when I set policies, I'm not worried about I'm not worried about where the, you know, how it's getting to the user. I know that it applies to all of my clouds in exactly the same way. Is really what makes this um, really powerful. So I set a policy that applies to Azure or anywhere else. This was definitely very interesting, and thank you for being second time on the show. We hope to see you in the future. This is in three and four. Yeah, absolutely. It's always good being here with you guys. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode.